Hey folks, uh, today we're going to be looking at some of the classification and scales of the bony fish. We're not going to go into too much detail because quite honestly it's, it's a really big undertaking to classify all the bony fish. They are a huge group um, and it's well beyond the scope of what we do in here. So we're just going to kind of focus on the main groups and see some of their characteristics and make it so we can tell the difference between the two. Um, you will hear some shark comparisons um, because some of these primitive bony fish are very shark-like. So let's take a look. All right, so first of all, when we look at the classification of these, um, they're in a group called the Osteichthys, and that means bony fish. Now, originally this is a class. Um, the way the classification has been going, um, it varies quite a bit, um, but this is a very diverse class. There's a lot of species um, and their bony skeleton comes from ancestral vertebrates and the precursors to the bony fish were things like placoderms. We learned about placoderms um, with the big jaws. They were jawed fishes and everything in this group has very well developed jaws and very well developed fins. So it's a jump forward from those primitive fish we studied earlier. Now as I mentioned the classification with this group is very fluid. Um, so it used to be just class osteichthys and a couple subclasses, um, but since we started using more cladistics and DNA, a lot of things have come to light. Um, and when used in cladistics, in fact, the tetrapods, which includes um, us, is in one of these groups as well. It's not that way with the classical system. So we're just, instead of referring to some of these things as like classes, orders, some classes, we're just going to refer to them as groups. Um, because it's always moving around. Sometimes things can be in more than one group. Some are monophyletic, some are paraphyletic. So we're just going to keep it simple and call these things groups. Um, but in general, they're classified into two groups. One are the ray fin fishes, and these are the fish that have bony rays in their fins. So they're supported by bony rays. Think of something like a trout or a bass or something like that. And then there's another group that are called the sarcopteriogenes, and these are the lobed fin fishes. And they don't have these bony rays. These are things like lung fishes and coelacanths and really primitive things um, that were very likely to be the things that actually crawled out on land for the first time. So let's take a look. Let's start with the ray fin fishes, the actinopterygians. Um, now the vast majority of fishes are in here. This is almost everything. There is not um, a lot of lobe fin fishes out there. Uh, so the ray fin fishes are definitely the biggest group. Now all of their fins are supported by those bony rays we talked about. And they used to be divided into three super orders. Um, so we're going to talk about these groups in an order from primitive to advanced. Um, the one first group is called the chondrosteans. These are things like sturgeons and paddle fishes. And if you look at these right away, you will see very shark-like features in them. So that is the most primitive group. Uh, the next most primitive group would be the Holosteans. These are a little more advanced. These are things like gars and bowfins. And you can still tell um, that these things are uh, kind of primitive, but they look a lot more advanced than maybe the sturgeons. And they've lost a few of those shark features. Um, they still have somewhat soft skeletons. And the last group, the most advanced, are the teleosts. Now, if I showed you any fish, and I said, hey, this is a bony fish. What group is it in? If you said teleost, you would be right 99% of the time. This is by far the biggest group. Everything um, that you see in a coral reef would be in here. Um, everything in the ocean, mostly. It's just they're the biggest group. The other groups don't really live in the ocean too much. Um, but these are the most advanced fishes. And just about everything is in here, as I had mentioned. And they were very dominant by the end of the Cretaceous when the dinosaurs... Um, and all the, the reptiles um, were subject to that mass extinction. These things just really took over. So that is the biggest group. So let's look at the first one here. The first group is the sturgeon and the paddlefish. These are the chondrosteans. Um, and they get their name. You might notice it says chondro. And that's very sim similar to chondrichthys. And that's because they have a lot of cartilage in their skeleton. Now these things get really big. You can see this picture of this lady holding this big giant sturgeon. They generally live in cold waters. Um, a lot of them are in Russia. We do have some in the north here. But you can see um, they're very kind of armored. They live in the bottom. They get really big. 
Um, sturgeons can get over 20 feet. They're usually not that big, but they can. Uh, paddle fishes get about seven feet. They're usually around five. Um, and they're all the, both these fishes are primarily cartilaginous, but they do have some ossification. And if you look at the tail on the sturgeon up here, you can see the tail right here. Um, let me point out this tail right here. This right here, man, that's a that's a heterocircle tail, and you can even see the top lobe down in this picture right here. That top lobe is bigger, which means it needs to create lift. And if you look at the fins, how they're flat, they're almost shark-like. Notice that there's not a whole lot of um, pectoral fin in the side. The pectoral fins are lower like a shark, um, and it has kind of a shark-like shape. So even though these things have a lot of cartilage, and they are closer to sharks than maybe the teleos fish. Their ancestors were very bony, so their ancestors had bone, and they've kind of lost it, so these are kind of derived traits. So let's take a look. Um, see if I can fire up one of these videos here. Um, so let's take a look. So here is a paddlefish. Um, this is a common, or one of the most common chondrosteans, even though none of these are very common at all. Um, there's not a lot of species of these. This is an American paddlefish. There used to be a big one in China, but it's now extinct. Now, as you watch it swim, you can see right away it has a very shark-like figure. It has like dorsal fins like a shark, and all of its fins are hanging kind of below. There is one on the side. It's just a very strange looking fish. Right now this one's swimming along filter feeding. They just open their mouth and they feed as they go. Now of course filter feeding is not a very shark like feature. Sharks tend to be very predatory. Um, so you can see right away this is just a weird looking very primitive looking fish. Not a lot of fins. The dorsal fins way back. Um, I should say not a lot of fins at the top. Um, the pectorals and the pelvic and the anal fins hanging off the bottom. So these live in the Mississippi River, uh, places like that. Anyway, really good look at a paddlefish, a very primitive fish, and that would be in the chondrosteans. All right, so if we look at the next group, the holosteans, these are a little more common. Um, they're in the gars and the bow fins are in this group. Um, they do have that same kind of cartilage skeleton, um, but they've lost, um, or I'm sorry, they've gained a little more ossification. So they have this thin layer of bone that kind of covers that skeleton. So whereas they're still kind of um, soft in the body, they do have a little more um, bone than the last group, the chondrosteans. Now these are more related to other bony fishes. And if we go back to the, uh, the slide with the chondrosteans, you can see these little spiracles Remember, sharks have those and rays have those to breathe with. Um, chondrosteans have kind of maintained those characteristics, whereas the holosteans, they've lost that. Spiracles are reduced. You can't even see them. And notice the tail. It's close to a heterocircle tail, um, but it's almost completely homocircle. So they've kind of went more towards a bony fish tail. So these are more closely related to the teleos than the last group. Um, it's still very primitive looking and you can see the jaws in this thing this is a small gar and they just have these huge teeth so very predatory fish in here um, contains both the bow fins and the gars so here is a bow fin um, bow fin are really maybe they're not as primitive looking as the other ones but you can tell they're primitive right away by looking at their tail uh, the fin is tail fins kind of small the caudal fin and they have a very thick caudal peduncle but the dead giveaway with a bow fin it has that really long dorsal fin that starts in the middle and goes all the way to the tail and also has those fins hanging underneath so it's a pretty primitive looking fish the bow fin sorry about that so let's take go back and look at this other group the other group in here are the gars and here's a a clip from River Monster about I've the got to walk the talk. So let's take a look. I've got to venture into the Gar's own underwater world. Notice the size, very big. 
none of the Gar show any intent to harm me. In my view, it's the alligator Gar itself that has been the victim. It's amazing to get this close. This fish really is a miracle of evolution, a true survivor. But if anyone is going to see the real giants, this fish needs to be allowed to grow without persecution. Maybe then we'll get to see those 14 footers again. Anyway. It's quite a large fish there, and you can kind of see they live in swamps and things like that. These are freshwater fish, they're not saltwater fish, so. Um, Anyway, another really interesting creature, um, the gars. So they get really big, obviously, you saw from that video. Um, these things are a little more common than the other group. And those are the two most primitive groups. Now, if we look at the third group, um, which we will in a second, you'll see that just about everything in there is completely recognizable. Maybe you haven't seen a gar or a bowfin or sturgeon or a paddlefish before. Um, and that's because these two groups are not nearly as common as the other one. Now these primitive fish, because they have a lot of uh, cartilage in their skeleton and not as much bone, their fish scales tend to be a lot more armored. They're not as armored as the placoid scales where um, they have the dentine and they're actually embedded into the skin, but they do have very armor-like scales and they're kind of diamond shaped um, and they're really thick and bony. So they have kind of that external covering that sharks have, maybe not to the extent sharks have, but you can definitely see it. And in, as a general rule, the more cartilage fish has, the thicker and stronger its scales are. And these are no exception. So they have these ganoid scales. Um, they're a very, very tough, distinctive scale. And they're usually on things like gars and things like that. Um, sturgeons have very bony scales as well because they have a lot of cartilage. So the last group, the teleasts, basically everything else. I could list every group in here and it would take literally an hour uh, there's just so many different types they all have homo circle tails so the top lobe and the bottom lobe are symmetrical they're a lot more flexible than those other fishes their scales are very soft they don't have a lot of external armor and their internal bone is completely calcified and it's very light um, it allows for very high maneuverability and speed so uh, just about everything else falls in this group we're not going to cover um, these things in specifics because there's just too many but as I'd mentioned if you see a fish and you point at it and say it's a teleos you're almost always going to be right so that is the last group of the ray fin fishes and you in all these groups you can see these very distinct rays right here um, coming out of the back on this dorsal fin on this this looks like a perch here it just they're very distinctive um, and that's where they get their name the actinopterygians all right, so the other group are the Sarcopterygians. Um, and we'll take a look here after we look at the scales of these other ones. So the Chondrosteans and Holosteans needed all that external armor. These do not. Um, they're very thin, they're very flexible, and these are the papery scales that you see on fish. If you've ever cleaned a fish or you've seen a fish scale, this is kind of what you think they are. They think they're called cycloid scales. Um, they overlap. And it's kind of like really, really weak armor. They're almost very plastic-like, so very, very thin, very flexible. Because they have so much support inside with that bony skeleton, they don't need a thick scale. They can get away with a thin scale. Um, there's two types that these fish have, these teleos. They have cycloid and tenoid scales. Tenoid scales are just a little more overlapping. We see these in things like bass and perch. And they have little ridges to reduce friction and drag. With the... Bone, with the uh, cartilaginous fish like sharks and then the chondrostrians and the holosteans their skills are all about protection these are more about reducing friction and drag so they don't have these much for protection because they have bones so they just kind of use them to make them more fluid in the water now remember these two scales and then look at the ones of the last group the other group the sarcopterygians so these don't have bony rays in their fins, and these things aren't all that common. There's only a few species around. Um, they're called lobe fin fishes because their fins are basically fleshy lobes. There's no bone or anything in there to support it. Now the lungfish are in this group. They're pretty rare. Some of these have lungs and internal noses. These are a lot closer to things like tetrapods and amphibians and land vertebrates. Um, and when we look at the cladogram at the end, you'll kind of see that. 
And they have these very unique scales. They're called cosmoid scales. If you look at them, they're very, very thick. They kind of remind me of the cycloid or tenoid scales in that they overlap, but they are definitely bony. They're definitely strong, like the ganoid scales of the guard and things like that. So um, a very thick, unique scale. They're only present in coelacanths and lungfish. So um, very armored, very thick. They almost look like they're made of leather. Now, as I mentioned, this group, uh, the Sarcopterygians, can be broken down into two more groups. Um, the Dipnoi, which are the lungfish, these are most common in Africa, uh, South America, places like that. They do possess lungs and they breathe air. A lot of the fish in this group do something called estivation. They bury themselves or they make a cocoon of mucus and mud um, and they kind of cover up in there when it gets really dry out during a drought and they bury themselves, keep themselves moist, and they can breathe air for long enough to stay alive. Um, the air isn't their preferred method of breathing, but they can definitely do it and do it quite efficiently. The other group, the uh, crossopterygians, these are the true lobe fins, or maybe what we think about when we think about something that may have crawled on land. Now, the lungfishers definitely were related to those animals, um, but the coelacanth has very, very distinct lobes that support their fins. Um, and inside, their bones look just like a tetrapod. It doesn't look that much different than a primitive amphibian at all. So these two groups were the ones that led to the tetrapods and eventually came out of the water and then led to the other animals we're more familiar with today. So let's look at these two. The first group are the lungfishes. Now, they're very strange looking. Lungfishes don't have very big fins at all. They almost look lamprey-like. If you look at this bottom one down here, it almost does look like a lamprey, except the eye's a lot smaller. It has a different mouth, of course, and it's lacking all those big, long strip of gill holes. Um, but otherwise, the tail is, is it's just very lamprey-like. And you can see the tail. It, it almost looks like a bow fin, so it has a very primitive tail. And this fish, fish looks extremely primitive. Again, they're not very common. Let's look at this quick video of one um, where one is being hunted. So it's coming out of estivation right here. This is a fish, a lungfish been cocooned in mud and mucus underground for months, waiting for the waters to rise. Primitive lungs allow it to breathe air as it searches for the nearest pool. But reaching water doesn't mean safety. That's one ugly stork. The shoebill stork is a giant of the swamp, well over a meter tall. Its bizarre beak is perfectly designed for feeding in muddy water, where prey is difficult to target. A huge beak increases the chance of success. Yeah. Well, that was it's a big stork that got that, that lungfish so Anyway, you can see when it picked up the lungfish, it doesn't have a lot of fins on it or anything, it just has a couple kind of small ones hanging off. So those are lungfish. They, again, they live in Africa, South America, um, places like that. All right, the last group here are the coelacanths. Um, so the crossopterygians are kind of a peculiar case. You can really see the distinct lobe fins right here. So there's no rays or anything. These look like rays, but they're not. They're just kind of fleshy spikes that are sticking out. Um, they almost look like frog feet in the back. Now, what the most peculiar thing about the coelacanth is we thought they were extinct. We didn't even know they existed until we caught one in the 20s. We thought these were just kind of a thing in the past that we only knew from the fossil record. But um, they're alive and well. We caught one off Madagascar. And they tend to live in deeper waters. Um, where there's cliffs and caves and things like that. So off the sides where continents go down really fast, or islands do, like Madagascar, there's a series of caves and things down there. there. Um, 
you know, a thousand feet down or so, and that's where they live. They love that kind of habitat. So let's take a look here. People actually um, went diving with some of these things. Now, these are ones that have came up closer to the surface, but you will get a very good look at them here. So anyway, you can see the very clear um, kind of lobed fins here. And again, this is a very primitive fish. Um, so this is obviously in pretty warm water because the one guy um, that was taking the pictures, he wasn't even wearing a wetsuit. So um, that diver is, but the other one was not. In fact, let me go back here. The guy looks like he's wearing khakis and like a button down shirt. So the water can't be that cold there. So this is probably right off Madagascar. Um, it's the weirdest dive suit I've ever seen, um, but anyway, just a very, very prehistoric fish. You can see its eyes, um, they're made for deep water, um, and so on. So anyway, that is the coelacanth, really cool looking fish, um, across Opterygian, one of the most, uh, primitive fishes out there and thought to be extinct for a long time. Now, if we look at the, the limbs of one of these things across, op across Opterygians, you can see they're very close to the tetrapods um, right here would be typical lobe fin fish versus a tetrapod and you can see the analogous structures h u and r these are carpal bones and you can see they're very very similar to that of an early amphibian so um, their head structure is very similar and their tail is kind of similar basically you take the fins off and you got yourself a coelacanth or a lobe fin fish here so um, Anyway, it's very likely this is where these animals came from. The DNA matches up pretty well. And if we look at a cladogram of these things, it's actually even more obvious that they're more closely related to the tetrapods. So these are all the jawed fishes. Of course, first we looked at the agnathans in this cladogram. That is the L group. These are the hagfish and the lampreys. And then we looked at other things like sharks and such. Here's the placoderms. Those were the first if you remember they were the primitive fish with the big jaws um, big external bony plates and right here are the chondrichthys the lasmobranchs and the holocephali uh, the chimeras now after them here's the acanthodians and if you remember we looked at these they were called spiny sharks they were kind of intermediate fish and truly this is where they fit um, they're technically teleost fish but they're not truly bony and they're very shark like so they kind of fit in the middle here in our bony fish, here's our two main groups, the actinopterygian, which are the ray fins, and the two types of sarcopterygians, the lungfish, and then the coelacanths. Um, so uh, here are those other groups right here. And of course, then we have an amphibians right here, and then amniotic animals, things that have eggs like mammals and birds, um, and things like that. So you can definitely see that the lobe fin fishes are very closely related to the amphibians. All right, so that is it for just fish classification. We're not going to go into any more depth than that or detail than that. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask during our office hour. And I will see you guys in Canvas conferences. Have a great day.